Hello, this is Nation Beat. I am Janelle Norville bringing you this brief on the pulse of our nation and highlights around the heart of St. Lucia. Progress is made on restructuring the institutional arrangements surrounding tourism development and management. Fishers urge to increase sea safety measures as the 2018 Atlantic hurricane season enters its peak period and vendors are now better prepared to reap the benefits and compete in the regional tourism market. Since its launch in May this year, the Tourism Advisory Committee has brought together a multi-stakeholder advisory group comprising public and private sector representatives as well as NGOs who have an interest in bolstering tourism development and management. The committee has been working steadfastly to resolve long-standing bottlenecks that impede product development and enhancement. It is expected to generate consensus on the way forward for the development and management of the tourism sector in St. Lucia and evolve into a more formal and permanent council. The government of St. Lucia aims to improve quality of life by ensuring that sustainable tourism remains integral to national socio-economic development. It requires a strong framework that is integrated into national and sectoral plans, sensible business practices and consumer behaviour. The establishment of guidelines and regulations in accordance with national priorities and legislation is important for promoting and supporting sustainable tourism. Towards that goal, the Tourism Advisory Committee is working on the framework and three-year strategic plan for St. Lucia. And now we're going to go on to the other aspects of strategic planning, missioning, and um, also we've been through the SWOT analysis, and we had a very, very productive first day, I thought. Um, I love the enthusiasm which we saw around the room, the diverse viewpoints on tourism, and the role that it should play, and the role that it was structured was very evident. And... I am very, very um, proud of the statements made by our facilitator uh, when she mentioned that St. Lucia in many ways were pioneering uh, this exercise. So I think we should all be proud that um, we are the second island in the Caribbean within the CTO region that is going to or has established a interagency uh, collaborative management organization. Tourism is one of the world's fastest growing industries and an important source of foreign exchange for St. Lucia. The sector is crucial to increasing economic benefits because of close linkages to others and its ability to create decent jobs and generate trade opportunities. A lot of the issues we face here are certainly issues that the region faces as a whole. Um, Regionally um, uh, and internationally, the issue of, of airlift is a big one. The connectivity uh, between our islands, um, regionally but also internationally. So we're talking about inter-Caribbean airlift, also international airlift. Uh, so the transportation issues are, are issues that we all share. Um, people development, really, the, the skills development is, is very important. Um, we want to create more linkages to other sectors. Um, manufacturing, agriculture, creative arts. So that's also really a regional concern. And then the marketing of the region. Um, here is a region that is the most tourism dependent, dependent region in the world, yet we are losing from year to year, we are, we are losing global market share in tourism. It should be the opposite. We should be gaining every year. So we need to look what is causing that and we need to work together to market ourselves and by extension, the entire region much better. Well, our expectations is that we, the, the role of the manufacturers is recognized, the linkages are understood, um, the benefit to the nation that all sectors are integrated into the whole tourism industry is very important. Well, we have to make sure that um, our products are recognized, the quality of our products are recognized, um, that we have a variety of products that are interesting to the tourism industry so that, you know, basically people don't have to think about importing from Miami, but they can get their products locally. Sustainable tourism requires community engagement in order for the benefits to trickle down to the man on the street. Members of the Tourism Advisory Committee are working with a specialist to develop a common starting platform for sustainable tourism, reviewing relevant trends and new terminology. Destination management, best practices for public-private partnerships, 
defining a common vision for tourism as identified and agreed by the committee is also a part of the process, as well as establishing the nomenclature and tagline of the council and confirming its mission, structure and terms of reference. They are setting strategic objectives and strategic goals today. They actually went through already an entire vision what they would like to see tourism um, like in St. Lucia, and we are looking at certain gaps, and then we'd see how all of the agencies and the ministries together could actually put something together to make tourism really much more competitive and to, to build on the economic growth that is happening around globally for tourism development, so St. Lucia could actually benefit further. This interagency ministry, it's actually a best practice um, recognized globally, so the United Nations World Tourism Organization is asking countries to do this. It's been done out of the region, within the region. The Caribbean Tourism Organization specifically wants this approach to take place. And we have seen St. Kitts have started. They have done really good work. They have a destination council made up of um, similar to this because they have gone through the process before. Um, the BVI is getting along and so on, but St. Lucia will be one of the first. The 2030 United Nations Agenda for Sustainable Development commits member states to devise and implement tourism policies that create jobs and promote local culture and products, while at the same time ensure responsible consumption and production patterns. The UN's 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, is a universal and transformative strategy for the global community to achieve in development in three dimensions, economic, social and environmental, in a balanced and integrated manner. It encourages the promotion of investment in sustainable tourism, including ecotourism and cultural tourism. From the Government Information Service, I am Anisia Antoine reporting. Vendors are now better prepared to reap the benefits and compete in the regional tourism market, having completed a training seminar facilitated by the OECS Regional Tourism Competitiveness Project. Here's Geraldine Bissett-Joseph. The vendor training program facilitated by the OECS Regional Tourism Competitiveness Project has come to a close. On the evening of the 4th of September 2018, the ORTCP held the closing ceremony for the program. In attendance were project organizers, facilitators, governmental representatives and participants who had completed the course. The workshop was one of several initiatives to be undertaken by the project as part of plans to stimulate the business aspect of the St. Lucian tourism product within the city of Castries. Organized by the Department of Tourism, Information and Broadcasting, the training program underlines efforts to support the upgrade of the Castries market and surrounding areas. The workshop focused on components such as tourism product development and marketing, environmental health and food safety, sanitation and hygiene, standards, business development and consumer relations, elements needed for the growth of a stronger tourism product. The fact that we're taking the time to do this, it is because you are important. It is because you are important to us, you are important to the tourism industry of St. Lucia, and we are prepared, and I hope by now that we have proven to you that we're not just about talking, but we are here to play a significant role in your development. Mr. Peterson Francis, Mayor of Castries, urged the vendors to retain the vital lessons learned during the program and to ensure that they put all new skills and knowledge to good use. We, as policymakers, contributors, and developers, should be dependent on you for quality of value, innovativeness, and usefulness of the training programs you receive during the workshop period. Remember the fundamentals and the overall goal of the training workshop. Challenge yourself, upgrade, take risks, but effectively share the knowledge and skills to better streamline your business. Vendors praised the initiative and shared with their fellow participants aspects of the program that they found particularly significant. Certificates were later awarded to all those who participated. For the Government Information Service, I am Geraldine Bissett-Joseph. 
The 2018 Atlantic hurricane season has entered the peak period of August to October. While the number of storms predicted for the season has been revised downward, the Department of Fisheries is urging fishers to increase sea safety measures during the hurricane season. Jacques Hinson Compton reports. Fisheries Extension Officer for Labry, VA4 and Savans Bay, Mr. Hardin Japier, says adhering to sea safety guidelines during the hurricane season is vital. When a fisher goes out there, mm -hmm. whether it be in the hurricane season or the dry season, mm -hmm. we, and we recommend that they do the necessary prerequisites, um, that is, carry the necessary safety gear and equipment. Mm -hmm. But that's even more important. During the, during the hurricane season. First of all, we have the oars on sail. That's in the event that, um, I mean, they have engine problems, they can sail. We, we um, also life jackets, one per, per, per crew. We have the, the night, day and night flares. We also recommend that, um, well, not recommend, it's a requirement to carry at least five gallons of water, drinkable water, per crew. The process of licensing vessels also helps to ensure that fishers are aware of all necessary safety measures. Currently we are under the licensing period, which has, we started in April. Mm. It's um, government financial from April to April. It's a one-year one year license is issued. Mm -hmm. So we do the inspection starting from April. That's for 2018 this year. Mm. And we make sure as an extension officer when you come to the fisher, before you, you make sure that they have the necessary safety gear and equipment. Fisheries officers say pre-voyage checks are essential as they ensure that fishers have everything they need before setting sail. The checks should be carried out by more than one person to ensure that all essentials are on board and should include food stores, extra water and fuel, navigational and communications equipment and safety gear. The lighthouse should also be informed of the fishers time of departure and estimated time of return. Reporting from the Government Information Service, I'm huh? Jack Kingston Compton. Our actions are our future. That's the theme for this year's World Food Day observance on October 16. The occasion underscores the global thrust towards the access and right to food by everyone. The issues of malnutrition and food security are paramount as the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Physical Planning, Natural Resources and Cooperatives sensitizes the nation to the significance of agriculture in every facet of daily living. You have to look at food availability, food affordability, mm -hmm. food access, and you go deeper than that, you're looking at now um, food and nutrition. Right. Because even if you have food and you're eating a lot of um, junk, junk food or, or your diet is exceeding in starches and carbohydrates mm -hmm. but no protein you're still not and you're not you're still not food secure right if you your diet is um, high in protein but no vitamins you're still food insecure mm -hmm. if you have eaten food 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 but you're not drinking enough water or as a, as a consumer, as a citizen, if you're not drinking enough water you're supposed to, or if the, the means for you having water is not there, there's, there's still a, a sense of food insecurity. Right. So all these things speak to food security, you know, all these aspects need to be looked at. The Ministry of Agriculture is continuing work on a land use policy, which is a critical element to regulate in the industry. The Roman Catholic Stewardship Office is partnering with the ministry in its sensitization efforts this year. Director Reverend David Popo says the implementation of the land use policy will lend to the revitalization of agriculture, as seen in countries like Jamaica and Barbados. What do we zone off in terms of production, for mm -hmm. agriculture, and for commercial, for housing, especially given the, the, the impact in terms of tourism development, right. you know. So I think these are some of the internal um, issues that, that have to be addressed, um, both by the private sector and government sector, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so that we can ensure that, again, that food is not just a privilege, but it's a right it's to a right. Yes. It, It's an imperative. While the land use policy is being hammered out, the Ministry of Agriculture continues to provide institutional support to stakeholders. The commercial food producers, which are the farmers, the fishers, and the food processors, and we facilitate them um, via different means. Mm -hmm. For the food producers, like for raw materials, like the farmers, mm -hmm. as you might already know, you have the agricultural extension officers, the livestock extension officers going out there and providing the technical guidance to those food producers as to how best to produce food in terms of quantity 
and quality and it's also including that the food safety aspects mm -hmm. and then you also have the the marketing unit which speaks to the um, food processors which do sort of do the same thing yeah. right and then we also look into the 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 normal householder the normal consumer and we encourage what is called backyard gardening mm -hmm. right where we encourage them you know in case you don't have the money to buy the food you don't have to worry. There's other means of doing doing it, and uh, we encourage him to go into um, having a little home gardening. The same flower pots, like you have right in your in your studio, the same flower pots. You usually put your your nice rose and flowers. You can put tomatoes in if you want, sweet pepper, mm -hmm. even cucumber, yes. right? Yes, yes. And you can grow what you want to eat. School leavers have been encouraged to get into the agricultural field, particularly agro-processing, as it ensures not just food security but job security as well. A food fair will be held at the Fondor Park on October 14. You can hear much more on that World Food Day Observance Thursday on the program Agriculture on the Move. This is Nation Beat. Coming up next, three developmental projects draw funding from UNESCO. When you're out at sea, there are no service stations along the way or supermarkets for a quick stop if you need something. It is essential that everything you will need while at sea is on the boat before you leave. That's why pre-sea checks are so important. Checks should be carried out by more than one person to ensure that all essentials are on board. Everything on board? Yeah, everything here. Still on shore. Yeah, port out with that, same boy. Pre-sea checks should include food stores, extra water and fuel, navigational equipment, safety gear and communication yeah. equipment. Okay, like that, Osla. That's what I'm doing. Before heading out to sea, always ensure that all the equipment is in working order, you are stocked up on food and also extra fuel. Call the lighthouse to inform them of your voyage plan and inform someone responsible of your departure time and estimate the time of arrival back on shore. For more information on obtaining a license to fish, contact the Department of Fisheries at 468-4143. Welcome back. Several underprivileged children were recently the recipients of school supplies made available to them ahead of the opening of the new academic year by St. Lucian living overseas. Fernel Neptune reports. St. Lucian-born Sherilyn Barthelme is giving back to her country for the provision of backpacks and other school supplies to the young ones, specifically those whose parents cannot afford. Barthelme is an executive of Cox Automotive Incorporated of the United States, which specializes in buying and selling cars. Junior Emmanuel Belize, who is the aunt of Sherilyn Barthelme, presented the donation to the Division of Education on her behalf. She says her niece is committed to playing her part to the success of deprived children within the school system in St. Lucia. This is not a one-off project. This is a project that will continue um, as the years go on and provide more and more opportunities for children like yourself and other children who may have not been a privilege to get assistance throughout this um, period. So she found that the opportunity for little ones like you um, and the happiness that you will fry from going back to school with your brand new stuff and your, your, your uniforms, your new school bag, your supplies will give you the joy that she did receive when she was at school. The supplies were presented through the Student Welfare Officer of the Division of Education, Miriam Henville. She applauded the initiative and thanked Sherilyn Barthelme for the donation, which she said will prepare the students to learn and succeed in the classroom. She is giving back to her country and underprivileged students of St. Lucia. We hope that you appreciate what she has done and that you take good care so that in the future it can be replicated so that more students can benefit from this gesture. As part of the package, the students also receive socks, undergarments, vests, shirts, reading books, and stationery. 
From the Communications Unit of the Ministry of Education, Innovation, Gender Relations and Sustainable Development, I am Fennel Neptune reporting. UNESCO has approved just over 180,000 EC dollars, the equivalent of some 67,000 US dollars for three local developmental projects under the UNESCO program 2018-2019. Presentations were made to the School of Arts and Design St. Lucia, receiving U.S. $23,000 for the creation of a publication on St. Lucian women sustaining lives and livelihoods through the arts. Associated Schools Project Network, ASPNet, received the U.S. $22,000 to help with a project entitled Sandwatch, which hopes to address climate change through education for sustainable development, while the Cultural Development Foundation, CDF, received the U.S. $22,000 to strengthen local capacities to safeguard St. Lucia's intangible cultural heritage. Secretary General of the National Commission for UNESCO, Marcia Symphorian, while heartened by the proposal submitted for consideration, has called for more local organizations to tap into funds provided by UNESCO, specifically under the Intangible Cultural Heritage Fund. This fund, which is open on a continuous basis, provides member states with a maximum of 100,000 US dollars for ICH projects and submission can be made at any time during the year. Minister with Responsibility for Education and the National Commission for UNESCO, Honorable Dr. Gail Rigobert, has meantime called for more formal training of government departments and civil society organizations in project proposal writing and reporting to avoid lost opportunities and for those successful to meet their obligations under the arrangement. I also know as well that there are agencies or entities that have received funding from international agencies and have not been able to meet the reporting requirement. If, if an agency is making money available to you, it is expected and it is understood, or it should be understood, that you are obliged to report on how the money was spent and how impactful the project um, has been. Only two organizations were on hand for the presentation, both the Cultural Development Foundation and the School of Arts and Design St. Lucia thanked UNESCO for considering their proposals and pledged their commitment to meeting their obligations under the program. The very nature of intangible is that we would have allowance, say, as we in the season for allowance, and once that is done, it's gone. And so for the CDF to take on actually trying to document the intangible cultural heritage in St. Lucia, I think is a laudable task. We hope that this publication will inspire young aspiring artists and creatives to follow their passion in whatever art discipline they choose. Funding for these projects is in keeping with UNESCO's efforts at providing financial technical support to member states for activities in UNESCO's fields of competence, education, natural science, social and human science, culture, communication and information. From the Communications Unit of the Ministry of Education, Innovation, Gender Relations and Sustainable Development, I am Chris Satney reporting. The Ministry of Education, Innovation, Gender Relations and Sustainable Development has appointed an interim board of governors to the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College with immediate effect. Minister for Education Dr. Gail Rigobert highlighted her confidence that the board has the required assets to see the college through the many issues requiring immediate attention. My team from the Ministry of Education and I will meet with the incoming board of the South Lewis Community College and I'm very excited about that. So Arthur Lewis has been in the news for a while and whereas I was very ready to name that board within 24 hours of the resignation of the last board, I, I thought it necessary to engage more stakeholders and to allow for a greater input in the selection of that board. The board is constituted for a period of six months and consists of six individuals, namely Dr. Joycelyn Fletcher, who is the chairperson, Dr. Rufina Fedrick, Dr. Vanessa Nervé, Barry Cookran, Dr. Claudia Louis, and Beverly Josie. Dr. Gail Rigobert explained that the board was carefully selected on the basis of expertise and skill. I'm satisfied now that we've been able to select a board that is equally committed to ensuring that Sir Arthur Lewis remains the premier tertiary institution on Ireland. 
Um, but we can't escape the fact that we've got some tough decisions to make. And I pray that that's the good publicity that Sir Arthur Lewis got recently, that all of Sir Lucia stands ready to, 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 stands ready to work with us to make this happen. The Cultural Development Foundation, CDF, plans to use Creole Heritage Month 2018 as a platform to celebrate one of the nation's icons, Joseph Ramopolio, also known as Papa Kilti. The CDF and the Folk Research Center, FRC, will host the Icon Series. The series celebrates individuals who have made significant contribution to St. Lucian culture. Director of Events and Production at the CDF, Junior Frederick, says this year's event will be an outdoor concert in Polia's own community of Bellevue. And you may ask why we're not doing the event at the Cultural Center. This gentleman has contributed to his community and why not go to the community of Bellevue where he'll be celebrated as an individual and that is where he lives. And of course, we're using the primary school at Bellevue which will be transformed According to Frederick, the event will have an edutainment component. The term refers to the effort to educate the public on polio and his work. We will have a traveling theatrical production, which will comprise of young, talented persons um, who will tell the story and the history and the impact of Ramo and his music. That will be done at school zones around the island a short film competition and a commissioned video on Ramo's music using an element of that to be aired on television. The production itself um, is slated for, as I said, the Bellevue Primary School, October 1st. It officially starts at 5 p.m., but it begins at 3 o'clock. Polia has been playing the violin since the age of 15. No stranger to accolades, Polia was awarded the St. Lucia Medal of Merit in 2000 by the Governor General. And that's Nation Beat. Join us next time as we feel the pulse and heart of our community. I am General Norville.